And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ivan Gaspar. Good afternoon. The New York Crystal Palace was many things. A showcase of the fruits of, continuing, of the continuing American colonial project, a bid to join the club of imperial nations, an assertion of both Yankee ingenuity and a growing American independence from a reliance on predominantly British capital. It was also an exercise in real estate development. This has many resonances today in a city consumed by real estate development ambitions and the profits it affords. But its very possibility means asserting a right to title to the land on which such developments, all developments, take place. As we're all aware, that right to title is morally, if not legally, murky at best. The building of the New, York, the New York Crystal Palace depended no less than did the building of, say, the Woolworth Building, the Empire State Building, or Trump Tower, on a morally challengeable assumption. Now, some of you will be wondering what on earth I'm talking about, though our late colleague David Jaffe knew perfectly well. And others of you will understand these claims, yet dismiss them as irrelevant to present-day realities. After all, where are the Lini Linapi today? What has become of Linipehoking, the traditional Lenape territory? But not every settler American has set aside such concerns. Just two years after the exhibition of the Industry of All Nations opened in Carl Gildemeister's spectacular building, Henry David Thoreau published the first part of his essay on Cape Cod in June 1855, uh, issue of Putnam's Monthly. He did not subscribe uncritically to the settler myth of untrammeled claims to Indian lands. And what he wrote of Cape Cod, but it equally applies to New York, deserves to be heard. This is quite a long quotation from Thoreau's Cape Cod. When the committee from Plymouth had purchased the territory of Eastham of the Indians, it was demanded who laid claim to Billingsgate, which was understood to be all that part of the Cape north of what they had purchased. The answer was, there was not any who owned it. Then, said the committee, that land is ours. The Indians answered that it was. This was a remarkable assertion and admission, continues Thoreau. The pilgrims appear to have regarded themselves as not any's representatives. Perhaps this was the first instance of that quiet way of speaking for a place not yet occupied, or at least not improved as much as it may be, which their descendants have practiced and are still practicing so extensively. Not any seems to have been the sole proprietor of all America before the Yankees. But history says that when the pilgrims had held the lands of Billingsgate many years, at length appeared an Indian who styled himself Lieutenant Antony, who laid claim to them, and of him they bought them. Who knows, but a Lieutenant Antony may be knocking at the door of the White House some day. <laughs> at any rate, I know that if you hold a thing unjustly, there will surely be the devil to pay at last. This was one of the many matters I discussed with David Jaffe in the course of our explorations together of the concepts underlying his first focus project, Visualizing 19th Century New York, which opened in 2014. At a relatively early stage in the conceptual preparation of Visualizing 19th Century New York, 
David had a Leave Fellowship at the Charles Warren Center for Studies in North American History at Harvard. Each fellow has to present his or her work in progress at the Warren Center and History Department seminar. This is a notoriously fierce group. I've seen internationally distinguished historians reduced to blubbering wrecks by <laughs> tough questions from Harvard's ruthless faculty. Or at least I've seen them turn white as sheet. I was determined to be there when David presented his work as what I hoped might be a supporting presence with a sponge and towel, as it were. The room was packed. But David had received his PhD at Harvard as a student of Bernard Balin, and he knew the score. David presented his research questions and his slides of an array of pertinent material culture items with his initial arguments, some confidently, some tentatively. Some historians will be skeptical of the value of material culture to historical inquiry, no matter what a proponent may say, and there were plenty of skeptics in that room. But David made a brilliant case, clearly won over several doubters, and emerged with some excellent new suggestions from his interlocutors. Above all, he came away with a vindication of his approach and his agenda. I count it as a turning point in the development of his own confidence in pursuing the project with an exhibition and a digital publication as its outcome. Visualizing 19th century New York had been David's first foray into the investigative mode of the research exhibition, and in spite of the challenges, he really took to it. It was a triumph. He realized that this was a medium he could master, and this success prompted David to propose a second project on New York's Crystal Palace. Vital to David's method in pursuing his research agenda in both projects were two interlocking factors his championing of digital media as a vital constituent of the project in sometimes, to me at least, alarmingly innovative ways, and his championing of the capability of his students to produce first-rate work that could, that could become not ancillary, but part of the very substance of the project. This was no less true of New York Crystal Palace than of visualizing 19th century New York. He worked tirelessly with successive directors of the Digital Media Lab, uh, Kimon Keramidis and Jesse Mirandi, to produce digital components that embodies his students' work no less than his own. His was the dedication of a teacher confident in the abilities of his students no less than that of a research scholar. As we know, David tragically did not live to see the results of all his work on New York Crystal Palace. Everyone on the team from both the gallery and degree programs has striven to realize David's vision for the project. This is one vital example of how the inspirational work of one faculty member can bring together the two parts of Bard Graduate Center, the gallery on the one hand and degree programs and the research institute on the other in a single endeavor. This is part of David's legacy in this remarkable place that has a resonance far beyond its walls. Now, to pursue and discuss further the collaborative nature of New York Crystal Palace and David's leadership role in its realization, I'm going to be joined by four of the many participants who worked, whose work has made this project possible. And I'd like to invite them to come up to the table now, and then I will introduce each briefly. So leading the charge is Jesse Morandi, director of the Di Digital Media Lab at the far end. And beside him is Anna Estrades, who is a curatorial assistant in the gallery. And then beside her is uh, Caroline Hanna, associate curator and production curator for the project. And <coughs> nearest to me is Lara Schilling, who's manager of education and community outreach for the gallery. I should add that both Anna and Lara, who are graduated from Bard Graduate Center 2016 with their master's degrees and were students of David on this project. So I'm going to ask each of them in turn to make a brief statement about their individual roles in the project. And let's start at the far end with, with Jesse. 
Right. Hello, everybody. It's really an uh, honor to be here and celebrating this uh, exhibition launch. It was a very trying at times and difficult process, and um, I really will reiterate Ivan's words that it really took a team, a community, and a family to realize this project. And I'm proud to have been a part of that, and I think the work stands on its own um, from the inception and David's ideas to the realization in the gallery. It's a really powerful statement of his uh, intellectual scholarship and his championing of student work and working with his fellow faculty and staff members to realize just an amazing project. So I just wanted to say that first. Um, so part of uh, working with David, he, I will just say that he had a very ambitious digital plan. And in fact, starting from the groundwork he laid with the Visualizing 19th Century New York project, he actually was looking to ramp up the next level for the Crystal Palace and had um, a, I would say, there's four projects that are visible here, but a five-pronged digital uh, approach to what he wanted to integrate between the gallery and the digital elements that were going to be in the gallery, but that would also be the legacy of the exhibition following the closure of the gallery, uh, the actual exhibition. So at first, in our initial meetings, and it, it was, uh, he had proposed these different aspects, and, and I was thinking how this was a lot of work. This was going to be a, quite an incredible uh, lift. And then so there was the one that is not shown up here is an audio tour, and I'll, I'll briefly describe these, but I was suggesting, David, maybe we should cut back on the, maybe not do the audio tour, but he's like, the audio tour stays. It was like <laughs> the one thing he fought, so he was like, we are keeping the audio tour. And you could just get a sense of, like, his vision was set, and he was determined to realize that vision. So uh, I've carried that passion through with, like, I wanted to make sure that we honored that because he fought so hard for it and I was willing to fight for him to get these projects realized. So there, the four parts are really, uh, we'll talk more about the exhibition, but the digital publication is the uh, kind of the uh, digital alternate to the text publications that we typically do for the exhibition uh, shows. Uh, so this embodies all of the students' work in the essays, and this is really a, one of the ways I think David Page tributes to the upcoming scholars in the field, because uh, aside from his introduction, this work is his students' work and featured um, quite nicely in a very beautiful publication. So you'll see all these in the gallery, and I hope you all get a chance to see these. But the publication has all of the essays as well as the objects. So this is, these were built in coordination, all, all the aspects I'll show you were built in coordination with CHIPS, who is a development company, and the great team we have here. So it starts in the focus group in many, many meetings, and we review David's plans and go back and forth with him, and then we start talking to developers and end up with these beautiful projects, which are, uh, as I said, a real collaborative effort between all aspects of our institution. You'll be able to see all these in the gallery, as I was saying. So this is just for instance, I know this is one of Ivan's favorite slides, the, <laughs> the destruction of the Crystal Palace here. Um, and all of the chats here and the, the tombstones were all written by the students as well, and their names are, are all visible throughout the project. I think that was one of the things that struck me is David had published and he had been in the field for a while and it was really his, his drive to make sure that the students would um, be, get the visibility in this project, although his, his, he's obviously uh, involved in all aspects of this. So um, let me just, this is hard, I'm gonna have to crane my neck here to go back. Um, the next part, so each of these tried to address an aspect of the New York Crystal Palace, which was otherwise difficult to convey through just the objects of the exhibition. So these were all additive. They were not meant to be uh, digital tricks to just put in the gallery to um, 
entertain the visitors, although I feel they are very entertaining. These digital humanities, I consider this a, a monumental digital humanities project, which asks engaging questions, creates a, a, an engaging way to present that material, and also asks the audience to participate and uh, be involved in that final creation. So this stroll through the Crystal Palace was a really a way to look inside the Crystal Palace, which is very difficult. There are only a few surviving photographs, which you can see uh, one of them in the exhibition. Uh, this uh, engraving is from 1854 from uh, Gleason's Pictorial. Allows you to look through and kind of scroll through the <coughs> exhibition and get a really detailed look at this amazing work, but also um, try to imagine what it was like to be in this space surrounded by people in a, a, uh, a physical space that was just chocked full of uh, exhibitions, objects, and sculptures, and artworks. So this is, this was just came out beautifully. I loved working on this. Um, and then the visitor's companion was looking at a way to, that we could ask um, ask questions about what it was like outside the Crystal Palace, so contextualizing the exhibition in a more uh, interactive way. What else was going on? What, how did people get to the Crystal Palace? What did, they, what did they do other than the Crystal Palace? What was there to see? So um, I worked on this with uh, Anna. This was one of the parts of the project that was, I would say, the yeah. least developed um, when David w became ill, it, it was very difficult to, we wanted to honor him in every aspect. And while he was able to, we were trying to, you know, encourage him to participate. But at a certain point with ha having to know we had to realize the project. Um, and then when he passed, I would say Anna did an amazing job. And, and true to David's vision, I, the first thing I thought was to re-involve students back in making this project uh, become a reality. And so I invited Anna, I invited other students. My DML staff were instrumental in finding information, doing more research than had already been done to bring this to light. So this was really a, a, an amazing tribute also to David's vision. You can browse this more. I won't go into them too much, but each of these sections you can learn more. This was Niblo's uh, saloon, which was another one of the first fine dining restaurants of the time. And you can kind of uh, go through this map and get a chance to look at some of the amazing things that were going on in New York City. So this one really was a, an attempt to root, uh, root visitors to our exhibition in the historic context of the time. And then finally, if I can, it's going to be hard for me to see was the audio tour. And this was, as I said, <laughs> David was championing this audio tour. So this was an amazing way to bring human life and voice and create, um, I encourage you all to go visit this when you're in the gallery. Um, there are bookmarks and there are instructions on how to do so, but if you visit nycp.audio, you can access this page. And throughout the exhibition, there are tour stops, and you can listen to one of these three voices, which will offer their unique perspectives on the exhibition. And so this was uh, really fun to produce and worked with uh, staff and students to record the voices. I myself played the part of Walt Whitman. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna sample just because this is really great. And if they, uh, so this is Aunt Kitty. This was from Peterson's Magazine, which was a, I guess a manners. So it was a magazine, and this mm -hmm. was a, ser a serialized um, piece of fiction writing. And when you read it, you really hear this voice of this woman visiting from rural Pennsylvania. And she's not a refined lady at all, but she is reacting very honestly to the hubbub around her. And, yeah. and so we tried to keep true to that voice that was on the paper. So this but was these were all, I should say that all these scripts were written by students. All mm -hmm. the interactives were conceptualized by the students in their initial phase and really quite, quite developed. Yeah. So, yeah, the groundwork was laid. It was, uh, it was very, uh, this was entertaining. Let me play you a clip from uh, the Machine Gallery. Is that, uh, I don't know. 
this was so these are all connected to objects in the exhibition space so. Did you ever see, see so many, many mechanical, mechanical contrivances in one place before? A body hardly knows where to begin. I reckon it'd take all one's born days to see it all. I thought we might start by looking at some of the newest inventions for the home. In the machine arcade. You must see this in the sewing machine. It is a true labor-saving device. Look how quickly and evenly it stitches. My, it's noisy and quick. I find it rather frightening. I wonder what old John and Jones, the tailor down our way, would think of it. Anyhow, it's a blessing to have the dumb iron thing doing the work of a human creature. Just think, you can make all the lace fashions right in your own home. The thought of a dozen new dresses thrills me. Not me. I haven't needed a new dress in years. And hand stitching does the job perfectly well. With all, With all the other, other work needing to be done, done, how do these women demonstrate here if we find the time to learn how to use that word machine? machine. The, the thought of it exhausts me. So that was one, one example. And uh, that was our Melissa Gerstein, who works in our public, um, public programming office, and Alyssa Velasquez, who is a student here, were the two voices for that. So I encourage you all to listen to the audio. Each one of them is very unique and gives a really uh, different perspective. The last one, besides Walt Whitman, is uh, a character, a, fic a fictional character by the name of Philip de Grasse, who is a African-American porter living in Seneca Village during the time of the exhibition. So it's a really unique kind of um, person who did not get to go inside the exhibition, but looks at it from an outsider's perspective. And David was always, pushing this, uh, looking through these different lenses as a way to understand this exhibit that wasn't always uh, a miraculous, shining, gleaming beacon of uh, hope and in industry. It was a very, it was very fraught and a very difficult time as much as there were innovations occurring. There was also uh, social issues which were, I think, are freshly looked at through this character's voice. So I encourage you all to look at it and all of these throughout the exhibition. Thanks, Jesse. So. <laughs> that's, that's great. Great introduction. So Anna, since you were so involved in the, in, in the digital elements, would you like to uh, start from start? the digital yeah. elements? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, thank you all for inviting me to this uh, talk. It's a pleasure for me to share. Uh, what I have contributed to this project because it has really been a full year for me uh, since I started as a student with Professor Jaffe in, in the spring of last year and now it's spring again and uh, I was at the opening last night dressed in period clothes with my camel. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, the interactive actually is uh, a very good example of the student faculty and curatorial collaboration and uh, as Jesse already introduced, I had to um, come back <laughs> right, um, and work <laughs> further uh, in that interactive. When I was a student in the spring, um, we were four working in this student interactive. I see one of my colleagues here, Sheila. And, uh, Sheila. and back then we had to do the audio scripts we had to do the digital publications our own essays we had to do research it was a lot to take in so our exterior interactive had um we had a, a the flesh out the full idea and is what you see here is um uh, a newspaper from the time uh with three different city sections from uh, the building, the Crystal Palace that you see top, to the Latin Observatory and the neighborhood uh, around the Crystal Palace. And then attractions in the city and also how to get to the Crystal Palace. Um, so we did have these sections and each of, you, if each of us contributed to them, but uh, we couldn't dig that deep in them. So when I came in, I used that information and then I had to uh, kind of do further research with Jesse. And one of the, uh, one of, I would say, challenges of that in doing it later is, for example, we needed to find public domain images. 
because it was kind of late to get all these copyright images in for all the hotspots that, uh, for example, you have um, here. So many of these images come from the New York Public Library digital collections, and you can actually find through, do a uh, search through public domain, which was very useful. Um, and um, yeah, I, I'm, I don't know if I have to add anything to that, to the exterior. Um, I think it's uh, great that we, from the beginning, we had the idea of the experience uh, in the Crystal Palace, and so the exhibition, when you go there, is divided between the exterior and the interior, and that's why we have the two digital components divided as such between uh, what you can do outside and <laughs> get into the Crystal Palace and the building, and then going inside and seeing the displays. So very, two very different experiences that we wanted equally balanced for, for the show um, in content. And um, I wanted to give an example as well of another as aspect. Can I go back? Yeah, click on the visitor's I companion, the white yeah. text at the top. I don't see the mouse though, that's like. Uh, there you go. <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah. I don't see very well. Yeah. What are you looking for? Just going through oh, the, yes, uh, the objects. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, one aspect I wanted to talk about is that research and the digital publication with the essays, because um, that's where you can find more information that is not just in the labels in the gallery. And uh, Professor Jaffe was very uh, supportive of my research on the uh, medals. Uh, both awards of the fair and the commemorative medals. Uh, I have an obsession for miniature and metals, cameos, coins, medals. So it was like a pleasure for me to uh, engage in that research. And I have to say that the project was divided in two semesters and I took part in the second semester. So for me, it was very important to um, use the awards uh, because there is this whole publication on the official words of juries, and it has all the information you need about all the exhibitors, their addresses in New York uh, or elsewhere, <laughs> also for the foreign countries participating, and why they receive a medal if they got an award or an honor mention. And many people got awards. <laughs> it's, um, the numbers are like something like, I have it in my essay, but um, um, you have like silver medals, that was the highest award, no gold medals, and the silver medals were given to about 100, 110 exhibitors. Then the uh, bronze medals were given to a oh, uh, thousand, over a thousand. Mm -hmm. And then you had honorable mention and it's several pages in this publication, so basically you have everybody mentioned in the publication. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we say a lot about uh, the Crystal Palace and how these wall fairs were really um, a platform for the exhibitors to uh, advertise their goods, to uh, you know promote what they were uh, making at the time. So I concentrated on two uh, manufacturers of glass and iron, uh, sorry, <laughs> and silver. Um, uh, or jewelry in general, so Tiffany and Co. and Glass, um, Brooklyn Glass Works, uh, because they epitomize the uh, Crystal Palace, the building, the uh, materials that I know we will hear more about from Amy Ogata. Um, so that is that, but actually um, I have to say that Jaffe's contribution was opening my mind to yeah, it's very good, the medals, the awards, right? But uh, we have all these examples of um, iconography of the fair in commemorative medals and souvenirs and tokens with the advertising from uh, exhibitors like uh, Fitzgibbon Daguerreotype Gallery, which is um, a token we have in, in, in the case. Um, and so I explore all of those, and though they look very small in the in the case in the gallery, it was very very fun, a lot of fun. And um, 
yeah, I, I think <laughs> I don't want to go in on too much longer. Good. I could talk about good. that also. <laughs> for that whole. <coughs> but yeah, I basically I think <laughs> what I wanted to <laughs> to um, conclude is that um, being part as a student and being part professionally in the gallery and seeing the project transform and come to fruition was uh, a pleasure and very special and I wish David Jaffe was here with us uh, but I know he will be really pleased with uh, the job we made collaboratively. Thank Good, you. thank you so much. <laughs>
David was super encouraging. He loved the idea and he just let me completely run with it. Um, and I ended up consulting tons and tons of primary sources, primarily um, through digitized newspapers, um, which was kind of a new, um, that was a new avenue for me um, in, my, in my research work. <laughs> yeah, there's my digital <laughs> Yeah, Struggle for the Shady Side of the Omnibus, that's taken directly from a period newspaper. Um, and one of my interests was in, you know, what would it have been like to ride in one of these, in one of these conveyances? You know, they were rattling over the cobblestones um, until the Avenue Railways were put in, starting around 1852, 1853, um, which were, you know, grooved metal rails along the roads so that the carriages could ride smoothly and more quickly. They were just running along the cobblestones and in the dirt, and it must have been so loud. And probably people had really bad backs. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, in addition to that, um, I also worked uh, very extensively on one of the audio tours. I worked on the Philip de Grasse audio tour um, about the African American Carter living in Seneca Village, um, who he is based on historical sources, but he's a completely fictionalized personage. Um, we found accounts of you know, numerous African-American men living in New York at the time who were named Philip de Grasse, and we thought, okay, this is, you know, it's a plausible name, so um, we went with that. And um, this allowed us to tell a story um, about what was happening outside of the Crystal Palace, but that couldn't really be shown through exhibition objects. Um, it's unknown whether African-Americans were allowed into the Crystal Palace. Um, there's some doubt that they were able to enter. Um, and my group really wanted to think about what it would have been like for an outsider um, to experience the palace. And um, Seneca Village at that time, which some of you might know, um, is one of, the, one of the first African American communities, free African American communities in New York, um, which is between 82nd and 85th Street, between 7th and 8th Avenues in what is now Central Park. Um, and by 1852, 1853, um, there were a few hundred people living there. Um, and in 1853, around the time that the palace opened, the palace opened July 15th, 1853, the New York State Legislature um, decided to uh, allow a park to be built, allow Central Park to go through and be built um, using eminent domain, um, which meant that everybody <laughs> living in Central Park at that time, I think it was a thousand five hundred people or something like that including the Seneca Village residents um, they all had to leave um, and so this audio tour of Philip de Grasse allowed us to talk about you know deliveries he made to the Crystal Palace and sort of seeing its construction seeing all of the hubbub outside of it and experiencing a little bit of hope about this kind of maybe the Crystal Palace's beacon of democracy freedom and then on the other hand um, you know he talks about the Fugitive Slave Act he talks about the very real fears um, of people in his community um, and his last entry on the audio tour um, is uh, the day after the Crystal Palace burns um, on October 5th 1858 and um, this is also uh, about two years after um, all the residents living in Seneca Village were forced to, to leave their homes. And so it's kind of, we, we very intentionally drew some parallels kind of about, you know, hopes invested in this great World's Fair um, and, you know, questioning how successful it really was um, and then using the burning a little bit to talk about, you know, maybe a little bit of foreshadowing of the Civil War, what was to come. Here at time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> so, in introducing Caroline Hanna, uh, who was the uh, who's associate curator in the gallery and the cu and the production curator for the for the whole uh, endeavor, uh, I just want to mention that she recently received her PhD. So. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, in that sense, I kind of have both sides, both on the staff and the curatorial perspective and a bit of the student perspective, because I did work on one of the first student projects, Face Mania, which <laughs> dates me, as many things do. But um, in any case, it was a real pleasure to come in and work on this project with David. I can't, it's probably good that I'm going last, because I really came in in the later stages. I wasn't on staff during the courses. Um, 
But I came, when I came in, I was handed the checklist, which students developed. Students were really integral to all, uh, all stages of this project, and, and I think that's really an interesting, and it's very much the choice of the faculty curator to the degree of their involvement. Um, but I, I got to have you know, some fun with it. Um, you know, as with you know, any kind of exhibition that you're putting together, something you ask for things, some things co you, know, you get, some things you don't, then you realize, okay, what have we got? Um, few holes to fill, what do we do? Um, and so we, you know, I had the task, you know, we kind of went back and forth, well, if we don't have you know, some of the key objects that David wanted in technology, for example, a daguerreotype camera, um, the hollow back violin that was um, invented by William Sidney Mount. We have the patent for it. Um, we didn't get that from the Smithsonian. They have it on view, um, understandably. But, you know, I, I was tasked with, well, do, are there others? There must be. And, um, you know, and finding some of these objects to fill these holes. So that was, that's a bit of the fun that curators have in going and doing research. <laughs> I found out, yes, there are more cradles of harmony out there by reading the liner notes of, of Mount's fiddle music because he was a composer too and he, he created a number of little <coughs> dance tunes which he also performed in the Crystal Palace. And the whole idea with the hollow back is that it made it louder for, for country dances. So I think that's a wonderful wonderful thing to have and that was an object that um, David was particularly keen on having so he was really pleased that we were able to to locate one. Um, being an objects person it's very important for me as part of my practice to see objects and to understand them and to understand you know all the various stories um, and you do have to restrain yourself because of course you're trying to hew to a particular narrative or set of narratives within within an exhibition and and that's always you know it's a little hard i you know i have you know i kind of span a l large part of the history of the um, bard graduate center in that i also did my master's degree before coming back to do my phd so i have that in fact i did my first internship with kevin staten at the at the um at the brooklyn museum so i was you know in the in storage, looking at all kinds of objects, trying, you know, ceramics and things, trying to sort them out. And I w was able to do a bit of that with this too, because we realized, you know, uh, one of the, you know, developing any focus project, we're very much a team that's um, <coughs> different, I think, than our main galleries in some respects. We have, you know, a team from academic, the academic side and the gallery side working together to kind of realize these things with the curator. Um, and one of the comments that came up in an early presentation of the exhibition design was, you know, this was so much about Victorian density. Are we conveying that? And, you know, at one point we were looking at, you know, when our checklist was coming together and we had a few turndowns and we had one very small pressed glass goblet one very large chair and not much in between <laughs> a little a little peri and statue of a very nice uh, nice nice um, lady but that's that's what we what we had so you know then i was like well we could fill this up and i had to you know restrain myself to thunder but we did bring in some, you know very nice tabletop because this was so much a moment for new york for um East Coast manufacturers, it's, you know, in my, one of my areas of research is in the American ceramics industry, which I was able to go to a private lender to fill that gap. And it's, you know, it's so much tied to the technology of the day, to the um, economy, you know, the way he described it to me, this is a high point between two low points, because while those manufacturers were able to produce Parian, were able to produce porcelain at that moment, they all closed within three years. So it's, it's really hard to keep the capital up. So even though that's a, you know, a very pretty arrangement in the middle, it also tells a story about um, business and industry and entrepreneurship. And also you know, a subtext that came up is, is immigrant artisan skills because <laughs> all of these various industries, the wood carving, the um, ceramics manufacturing, the glass cutting, which you know, being able to develop 
you know, those immigrants were from Baccarat. I mean, we can see why they could make, you know, these beautiful deep cuts. They were bringing their technology and applying it to conditions here in this country. So that was a big part of my role, fleshing out the checklist, and then also working with all, everyone on the various components, particularly in the text, of course, because we're very much, you know, we, we believe in research and we believe in putting that out, you know, the words out there. So there's a lot of, a lot of components to that. Thanks so much, Caroline. So in the, in the short time left to us, I, I just want to pose at least one question to all of you, for any of you or all of you, uh, but not speaking all at once, to pick up. Um, and the question I'd like to ask you in particular is, does this project differ from exhibitions in other institutions, in your estimation? And if so, how does it differ? How do these? How does this project and the focus projects, as a as a as a genre, um, differ from what happens elsewhere? Any thoughts? I know that working in the digital, that the because we're so focused on study of material culture and object studies, that um, this was really a unique uh, experience. I think uh, bringing together this full community. I think that defines the Bard Graduate Center in many ways is that you know from getting the uh, somebody from public programming to come and record a voice uh, voice tour from working with Caroline and and Marianne in the gallery to working for me with my DML staff of students and with students from David's class and all those aspects coming together I think as a research institution bringing together the working knowledge and the research that went into David's class and then further after that combined with the like first-rate gallery staff to realize this project I think I, I would say that that for me would separate this project from other institutions and in that there's just a full-on collaborative partnership between all aspects of our institution and it, I think it's a real tribute to this to this place great thanks yeah. Jesse I will also add briefly that um, there is a lot in-house, not just the digital media department, there is an in-house designer for the gallery and a lot is, is done in-house from label printing and the co quotations that you see on the walls, all that has been, the reproductions has been done in-house and that I think is very unique because allows us to be creative and mm -hmm. keep it as we want, want it to look like. Control, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Any thoughts? I just think it is very much about the process. And I mean, I would kind of revert that question back to the audience. Is that repro process reflected in the product, in the mm -hmm. gallery, and in the digital elements, the publication? Because, you know, from my standpoint, you know, just having, you know, this many people involved at different points and at different levels is a very interesting and a very um, energizing way to work. I really, I do really like that, that, that collaborative aspect. But does it show? I, we have a lot of text <laughs> in the gallery, and I think that's one, one, uh, one result, but maybe others. Yeah, I think I would say that, um, as I've been kind of walking through the exhibition yesterday evening and also earlier today um, and thinking about, you know, my experiences working with David um, and what excited me about his particular perspective and his work um, was his talent for really bringing together material culture with, like, very strong attention to social history and thinking about, like, how people lived and trying to get us students and I think also to get exhibition visitors to really feel that like from the almost the first session when we met last fall um, or fall 2015 for the class we read about um, the dome of the Crystal Palace which was like a hundred feet in diameter and colored glass patterned and so many people in the period commented on, on how brilliant it was and we sat there in the class and we talked for 20 or 30 minutes about all the different ways that we could recreate this feeling of the dome. And, you know, that was 
David gave time and attention to that. Like that was important to him that we work through those ideas and it was about the experience. It was, you know, trying to feel what 19th century people might have felt. And that's something that I've like really taken away and think about a lot in my own research now. So it seems to me from what you're saying that what is really particular about how David went about this project and how other members of the faculty who have done and are doing focus projects go about their, uh, their work is uh, that this is about process as much as about product. And I think that's something that's vitally important and, uh, and distinguishes Bard Graduate Center's approach uh, from other institutions. It's about how you get to where you get to in the end, rather than just getting there. And I think that's something that David uh, exemplified in a remarkable way. So I'd like to thank our four panelists for sharing their experiences on this wonderful project with us. So thanks so much. <laughs>